Have your summer 2020 vacation plans been upended? Well, Oz is open for business. On behalf of Tommy Quickstep Tours and the Nonestic Board of Tourism, I thank you for your interest in our upcoming all-inclusive tour package to see the Castles of Oz. This is our most exciting tour to date, more adventurous than our 2004 tour of the Gnome King's Caverns, more enchanting than the 2005 centennial celebration of the peace treaty between Ix and Noland, and, well, let's get the obvious out of the way, far safer than last season's unfortunate incident with the tour group that attempted to hike Mount Fantastico, and it goes without saying that Tommy Tours has refunded all expenses to those vacationers. We are most excited for this season's tour, which, for the first time, will break through the barrier of invisibility to offer a seven-day, 30-site expedition to see the posh palaces, the fabulous fortresses, the gorgeous gardens, and the thrilling throne rooms of some of the most celebrated castles in the wonderful land of Oz. This is a magical vacation you will not want to miss. Your adventure begins from the moment you board one of our two Ozo planes, bound for the Emerald City. Yes, airfare is included in the package. You can choose to board either the airship Ozpril, which departs Gilgad Royal Airport in the Kingdom of Rinkatink, or the Oztober, which launches from Crystal Lake Airport in the Valley of Mo. Please be advised that the Department of Ozland Security strictly forbids the transport of magical objects across the desert into Ozma's domain. After landing at Emerald City Field, you'll have the rest of the day to explore the most glorious place on the face of the earth or the sky. So hold on to your breath, hold on to your heart, and hold on to your hope as you march up to the gate and bid it open. You have only one short day in the Emerald City, so enjoy it, shopping or sightseeing, before relaxing in your luxurious room at the renowned Five Gem Emerald Plaza Hotel. And yes, all lodging is included in the package. On the morning of day one, you will depart for the Quadling Country, aboard the most celebrated vehicle in all of Oz, the Red Wagon. Almost a chariot, being inlaid with rubies and pearls, the wagon is drawn by Ozma's favorite steed, the wooden sawhorse, one of the most remarkable creatures in Oz. When the sawhorse is harnessed, there are no reins to guide him. You'll just need to tell him, head south. Your itinerary for day one includes visits and views of five castle sites in the bucolic quadling country. In less than an hour, you'll pass under the crimson arch that leads into the red lands of Oz. From the crest of the hill, spread out invitingly before you in the red plains and valleys, will be no fewer than five stately quadling castles in plain view. You will have no need to consult the guidepost man on this trip, as your next stop is breakfast in Bunnybury. You will skip Bunbury altogether. Good things to eat, but all very disagreeable. And take the other road to the city of the White Rabbits. Having our letter of introduction from Princess Ozma will gain our admittance, though shrink you must to pass through their gate. Everything is neat as wax in this city of rich green clover and handsome streets. In a square in the center of the city, just beyond the bronze statue of Glinda the Good, are the portals of the Royal Palace, an extensive and imposing building of white marble covered with a filigree of frosted gold. Your tour group will be met by a line of rabbit soldiers drawn up before the palace entrance. Once inside the castle, you will be received by the Rabbit King in his throne room all draped with cloth of gold and furnished with satin-covered gold furniture. You'll certainly marvel at the king's chair, in the shape of a silver lily, thickly encrusted with diamonds, with one leaf bent over to form the seat, upholstered in white satin. As a special treat for guests of Tommy Tours, the king has promised to assemble all the nobility of Bunnybury in the great reception hall for a breakfast of carrot cakes and spinach juice. Before departing, you'll have time to enjoy the gardens in the back of the palace. Marble-paved walks run in every direction, which are filled with beautiful flowers, fragrant shrubs, and many fruit trees. By noon, however, you will have to grow up and depart for your next destination. 
in the forest outside Bunnybury, you'll leave behind the sawhorse and board the marvelous fly about of us to begin an aerial tour from the skies above the quadling country. Without delay, on this very day, you will go tomorrow. Your tour will pass over the ancient and gloomy castle of Morrow, a rare and imposing old edifice. From the sky, you will be able to see its once splendid garden, now choked up with weeds, with vines running up and over the entire structure, covering even the windows and chimneys with a waving curtain of green. Now abandoned, the castle of Morrow was once the old hunting lodge of King Pastoria, and the site where Ozma and her father used to hide from the evil witch Mombi. As you approach the wild wooded hills of the southeast of Oz, near a lake of black water, you'll pass over the log castle of Crinklink, the giant, perched upon the highest peak in the heart of the hills. By mid-afternoon, you will land on the hill of Ragbad, a small patch of a kingdom way down in the southeastern corner of the Quadling country. There you will tour its old red castle, famous for its chintz and tapestries, its red ginghams and calico vines, its cotton fields and its fine linens and lawns. Ragbad is once again the supplier of the finest dressed goods in Oz, all grown in the gardens there. During your visit to the castle atop Red Mountain, you will learn about the rags to riches story of King Fumbo and his queen, Mrs. So-and-so, Prince Tatters, and Grandpa, an old soldier with a game leg who had fought in 980 ragbad battles and beaten everything, including the drum. There will be time to shop for the latest Ozian dress before the group departs for its final destination. You'll travel by Orc Caravan across the high mountains to the west into the most beautiful landscape, having a rosy glow. Spread out below you, extending as far as the eye can reach, you'll see bits of forest, fields of waving grain, fountains, rivers and lakes, pretty groups of houses, and a few grand castles and palaces scattered throughout. The turrets of one splendid castle will tower far above the tops of the trees surrounding it. This is the Palace of Jinxland. You will set down near a grove of stately trees that border the grounds of the castle of King Pon and Queen Gloria. Before dinner, you will tour the castle with its many rooms and all beautifully furnished. By following several winding and handsomely decorated passages, your tour group will assemble in the open court that occupies the very center of the huge building surrounded on every side by high turreted walls and containing beds of flowers, fountains, and walks of many colored marbles matched together in quaint designs. This courtyard is the site of where the evil King Cruel and Blinky the Witch were defeated by the Scarecrow. Your group will be given a grand banquet of Jinxland specialties that include red potatoes, red beans, and red velvet cake. There will be time to walk off your meal by exploring the lovely garden behind the castle. This large park, a favorite intimate spot for Pon and Gloria, is filled with bushes and trees, surrounded by a high wall, and nestled with quiet nooks. Later that evening, you'll celebrate the end of our first day with a grand dance in the courtyard, where the brass band will play Jinxland favorites such as The Orc Trot and Our Glorious Gloria the Queen. On the morning of day two, you'll travel by Orc to the magnificent castle of the great sorceress Glinda the Good, which stands on the edge of the desert in the southernmost part of the Quadling country. Drawing near this stately castle, you'll first catch sight of its towers and likely realize that it is far more grand and imposing than was the king's castle in Jinxland. The caravan will land upon a velvety green lawn close by a fountain that sends sprays of flashing gems, instead of water, high into the air, whence they fall with a soft tinkling sound into the carved marble basin. Then you'll have all day to explore this splendid castle. Here lives the beautiful Sorceress of the South, surrounded by a bevy of the most beautiful maidens of Oz, gathered from all four countries of the Fairyland. Glinda will receive your group in her grand court, built of rare marbles and exquisitely polished. 
a vast colonnade opens to the south, allowing the maidens to gaze upon a vista of rose-hued fields and groves of trees bearing fruits or laden with sweet-scented flowers. You can wander through the beautiful gardens, or rest on the patio, which is surrounded by the wings of the great castle, and filled with flowers, fountains, exquisite statuary, and many chairs of polished marble or filigree gold. Guests interested in the magical arts may wish to sign up for one of the hourly tours of Glinda's Laboratory, where you'll see the magical instruments and rare chemical compounds that she uses to protect the realm against invaders. Also included in the price of your tour package is a viewing of one of the most extraordinary magical objects in all of Oz, the Great Book of Records. Long before Google and Facebook, this was the premier volume to read news, all posted instantaneously from around the world. Be sure to like it. On the morning of day three, you will board Glinda's shining chariot, drawn by white swans, and melt into the pink morning clouds as you depart for an aerial view of the castles in the land of barons before heading west to Winkyland. From the air, you'll see a red rolling hillside below. Above the trees and on the hilltops, lordly castles rear their round red towers. Flags fluttering from every turret make the land of barons look extremely interesting and gay. Little patches of shadow lay on the velvety hills, small wooden parks dot the hollows, and visible in the distance are many castles, including those of Belfager and Shirley Sunshine. Beyond, a huge range of red mountains lift their craggy heads to the sky. Here, you may even spot Sniff the Iffin flying among the clouds. You'll also fly over Mogador's Mountain and see the city of Baffelberg, where Baron Mogador the Mighty and his little reddies have been banished. Now just a tiny red city on the rocks, this was once a mighty citadel, with turreted forts and stronghouses seeming to spring from the rock itself. Stretching round the mountain is a yawning chasm, and at the foot is a towered fortress and drawbridge. The wicked mountain chief's grim red castle clings to the rocks halfway up the mountain and has a splendid view of the whole valley beneath. At one time, no one had ever entered the city of Baffelberg or returned alive from Mogador's mountain. A trick-tilting tunnel entrance and towers that would tilt and shoot a shower of golden spears kept all but the bravest away. But look closely as you pass overhead, for each year the Red Baron's Historical Society reenacts the famous hairy escape of Peter, Jack Pumpkinhead, and Belfager from their captivity in the North Tower of this mountain fortress. Relax as you continue your flight across the sweeping plains of the Winky Country, enjoying a basket lunch of local hearty grange and delicious peaches. The tour group will land in the mountains west of the city of Herku for a tour of the unique Wicker Castle, built by the renegade magician and thief Ugu the Shoemaker. This good-sized building is rather pretty, but also extremely strong, because the sides, roofs, and domes are all of wicker, closely woven, as in fine baskets. Ugu abandoned the castle many years ago, though many have spotted a giant gray dove circling overhead. The gaudy peacock, though, perched on the walls and cackling with laughter, forbids the bird to land. In recent years, many real estate investors have considered purchasing and renovating this abandoned castle, but none have been successful in flipping the property. The Swan Chariot must return to the Sorceress of the South, so you will make the next leg of our journey riding in the flying magic dishpan of Keiki the Cookie Cook, who will also provide us with an afternoon snack of her famous treats. Our final two palaces of the day are the homes of the greatest of Oz celebrities and the finest of friends. First, you will meet the Scarecrow at his splendid castle on the banks of the Winky River. The structure is a classic example of the organic design movement that was all the rage in early 20th century Oz. Chief architect Jack Pumpkinhead created the mansion in the shape of an immense ear of corn. The rows of kernels are made of solid gold, and the green upon which the ear stands upright is a mass of sparkling emeralds. 
upon the very top of the structure is perched a figure representing the scarecrow himself, and upon his extended arms, as well as upon his head, are several crows, carved out of ebony and having ruby eyes. You may imagine how big this ear of corn is when I tell you that a single gold kernel forms a window, swinging outward upon hinges, while a row of four kernels open to make the front entrance. Inside are five stories, each being a single room, while the gardens around the mansion consist, of course, of cornfields. The palace is, in all respects, a very appropriate home for a scarecrow. He will accompany your group as you head to the nearby palace of his dear friend, the Tin Woodman, rejoining the sawhorse and the red wagon for the last trip on day three. From the summit of a hill, you'll see the City of the Winkies, with the tall domes of the Emperor's Palace rising from the cluster of more modest dwellings, its towers glistening magnificently under the rays of the declining sun. The Tin Woodman employed the skillful Winky tinsmiths in building his magnificent castle, all made out of tin, from the ground to the tallest turret, and so brightly polished that it glitters more gorgeously than silver. He has thousands of Winkies to keep it polished for him. His people love to do anything in their power for their beloved emperor, so there isn't a particle of rust on the big castle. Around the grounds of the castle runs a tin wall with tin gates, but the gates stand wide open because the emperor has no enemies to disturb him. On the sides of the pathway leading up to the front door of the castle are rows of very cleverly executed tin statues of Dorothy, Toto, the Scarecrow, the Wizard, the Shaggy Man, Jack Pumpkinhead, and Ozma, all standing upon neat pedestals of tin. The walks are paved with sheets of tin and brightly polished. You can pass the time before dinner wandering through the beautiful gardens and spacious grounds of the palace, where you'll find much to admire. Tin fountains, sending sprays of clear water far into the air, beds of tin flowers, all as perfectly formed as any natural flowers might be, tin trees, and here and there shady bowers of tin, with tin benches and chairs to sit upon. In one corner of the gardens, Nick Chopper has established a fish pond in which many pretty tin fish swim. Tin birds perch upon the branches of tin trees and sing songs that sound like the notes of tin whistles. Such wonders have been made by the clever winky tinsmiths, who wind up the birds every morning so that they will move about and sing. The emperor is proud of his tin castle and often shows his visitors through all the rooms. Every bit of furniture is made of brightly polished tin. The tables, chairs, beds, and all. Even the floors and walls are tin. Besides his glittering tin throne is a chair of woven straw for his best friend, the Scarecrow. At times they speak to one another of curious things that they've seen and strange adventures that they have known since they became comrades. But at times they are silent and find themselves content in merely being together. This truly is a fairy dwelling of a fairy prince. You will spend the night as the Emperor's guests with a private cozy tin bedroom having a surprisingly comfortable tin bed. You'll have time to prepare for dinner, which will be served in the grand tin dining hall, with entertainment by the Emperor's tin coronet band. When you wake on day four, let's hope for some bright sunshine, as our first stop will be the frightful castle of the Wicked Witch of the West. Then you'll head north to see four more Winky Castles. The Wicked Witch of the West had but one eye, yet that was as powerful as a telescope and could see everywhere. She would sit in the door of her castle watching for anyone who dared approach. From her castle, she commanded her fierce wolves, wild crows, swarm of stinging bees, her winky slaves, and, of course, the winged monkeys. A fully guided tour will describe these historic events that took place at the witch's yellow castle, the captivity of Dorothy and the lion, and the melting of the witch in her kitchen. The red wagon will then race northward, but you can make a very brief stop to see the gloomy gray castle of Pokes, the stupidest kingdom in Oz. You mustn't stay long, however, for fear of falling asleep. The only known way to escape this dull trap is to sing. 
By early afternoon, you should reach the very center of the North Winky Country and catch your first glimpse of Sun Top Mountain. Set like a crown upon the summit of this purple mountain is a glittering gold castle, the loveliest, laciest gold castle you could imagine, with a hundred fluttering pennants. All down the mountainside spreads its lovely gardens, golden arbors, and flower-boarded paths. You'll lunch in the castle with King Pampa and Queen Peg Amy before departing north. Just up the road is the Kingdom of Patch, where you'll visit the royal castle of this cross-patch country. You'll spend the afternoon learning about the craft of the industrious quilties, who gather the small cotton patches from their gardens and stitch them into quilts. By early evening, you should reach the far corner of the beautiful fairyland of Oz, where, away up in the mountains, lies a small valley named Oogaboo. Though some have called it the smallest and the poorest kingdom in all of Oz, Oogaboo does have a royal palace, from which Queen Anne rules her 89 subjects. Here you will have dinner of cabbages and pickle onions, and dessert of lemon drops, bonbons, chocolate creams, cracker jack, buttered popcorn, and jelly all from the orchards of Joe Candy, before retiring to your private guest room. No need for concern, these accommodations are rated four emeralds by the O Zagat, and I can assure you that your room will be clean. That whole business of who is to sweep the floor has been cleared up. Get ready for day five of your tour, when you'll sweep across the northern Gillikin country in the red wagon to see five more Oz castles. In the early morning, you'll ride past Sandy Sumandra, which also has many fertile valleys and lovely flowerful spots with daffodils and lotuses. Although life here is very lazy and luxurious, you'll have just enough time to snap some photos at the beautiful yellow castle. One of the highlights of your tour will be seeing the wondrous glass palace on the Isle of the Skeezers. Bordered by a green lawn, the Great Lake of the Skeezers is fully a mile from shore to shore, the waters of which are exquisitely blue and sparkling, with little wavelets breaking its smooth surfaces where breezes touch it. In the center of this lake is a lovely island, covered by a huge round building with glass walls and a high glass dome which glitters brilliantly. Exactly under the center of the lofty dome is a small park filled with brilliant flowers and an elaborate fountain, and facing the park stands the palace of Queen Oryx and Prime Minister Ervik. You will tour the palace and its basement, where the amazing machinery, designed and devised by the Crumbrick Witch Coeo, powers the isle. As an exclusive treat for guests of Tommy Tours will be a rare demonstration of its submersion. No other tour company has access to the rare mineral Gaolau. Burning some of its magic powder in the basin and murmuring the magic syllable will submerge the island until the entire dome is under the surface of the water. Do you remember the secret syllable? If so, say it now. Oh... In the afternoon, you will visit the splendid twin castles of Double Up, home of His Highness King Tutu II, King King and Double King. Your next stop will be Kimbaloo, and a visit to one of the coziest castles in Oz, that of Kinda Jolly, who had made a great fortune in buttons. This castle, set in the very center of a thick button wood, has more chimneys and windows than any dozen castles you can think of. There are some who think this castle extremely odd, built as it is of dark purple buttonwood, studded with rows and rows of bright buttons. But the castle owes much of its coziness to Rosa Mary, the quaint little queen of Kimbaloo, who keeps it spick and spandy and simply blooming with flowers. This she can do easily, for in the castle garden grows a simply enormous bouquet bush, where old and new-fashioned bouquets blossom in bewildering profusion. By sunset, you should reach Pumperdink, just in time for a royal feast. From the King's Highway that leads directly into the realm, you'll be able to see its castle towers. Life in this purple castle is so delightfully interesting and jolly that I can think of no happier place to visit. Dinner will convene in the great dining hall, where King Pompous, very fat and gorgeous in pearl-studded velvet, sits at the head of the table. 
Now, you must be sure to pack formal wear for your trip, as Kabumpo, the elegant elephant, insists that everyone in the court dress in their finest attire. Twenty footmen in white wigs and purple satin uniforms will serve a succession of savory viands. I believe that someone already registered for our tour will be celebrating their birthday on August 19th, and we've ordered a very special birthday cake to end the evening with a real bang. On day six, you'll travel by Airmobile. This fantastic flying machine is the wizard Conjo's ingenious creation, a most perfect means of air travel that has no wings, no propeller, and no jets, nothing but places to sit down. It operates on the principle perfected by the Wicked Witch of the West, defying gravity. Your short flight across the north of the Gillikin country is just the first stop on a day of touring several unique castles as you head towards the Munchkin country. The airmobile will bring us to the outskirts of the mysterious palace of Galette, the beautiful princess and powerful sorceress who lived here many years ago. She had her handsome palace built from great blocks of ruby and used all her magic to help the people. As I'm sure you know, Galette's palace is near the forest of the legendary winged monkeys. Now, other tour companies that come through this region of Oz have reported no signs of the magical simians. But we have a very special treat in store for travelers with Tommy Quickstep Tours. You've guessed it, you will get to ride, and please be sure to read the full liability statement in your contract, on the famous winged monkeys of Oz as you travel to see two more Gillikin castles. So hold on tight as you take flight to the proud, the pompous, the regal little kingdom of Regalia, high in the purple Gillikin Mountains. The castle of Regalia, with amethyst windows and spires, is one of the most splendid sights in the country. The Regalians, though of a somewhat proud and haughty, are really kind and merry at heart. King Randy and his subjects will entertain you with an afternoon of feasting, celebrations, and gay processions. Then you're off to visit the smallest palace on the tour. Hidden away, behind a bush in a sharp bend of the Gillikin River, is the Diamond Palace of the Lonesome Duck. The glistening dome is formed of the clearest diamonds, neatly cemented together, with a doorway at the side just big enough to admit the only duck in the land of Oz. Though not the most personable host, he's just vain enough to show us his creation, which really is the only diamond palace in the world. Your tour group will stop here only briefly, as others who have visited this area have gotten stuck longer than they'd wish. Your day will conclude in the Blue Palace of Sapphire City in the Osier Islands of Lake Horizon, located among high mountains in a remote corner of Oz. Unusual for a mountain lake in an inland location, Lake Horizon is a saltwater rather than a freshwater body and has been compared to an inland sea, but has beaches of gems rather than sand. The lake supports a population of large seahorses so big that the residents of the isles can ride them for transport. Five islands make up the Osier Isles, an independent polity with the Sapphire City as its capital. Just as the Emerald City is characterized by its emeralds, so the Sapphire City is dominated by the blue light of its distinctive jewels. The city contains a noteworthy sapphire tower having large silver bells that toll the hour. Here, Queen Orin, formerly known as Tattypoo, Witch of the North, will host a grand banquet in the palace, and Trot, a princess of Osier Isles, will be in attendance. For your final day of touring, you will travel down the Yellow Brick Road toward the Emerald City, with a side trip to see two of the biggest sights of your tour. In the edge of the Gilligan country, and really scarcely a day's journey from the Emerald City, lies the castle of Nandywog. You'll be able to see the turrets and spires of his imposing castle rise above the treetops from more than a mile away. His front door is 30 feet high and 30 feet across, for Nandywog is 20 feet tall, yet still the littlest giant in Oz. 
his castle was built by the tripedalians who serve him still windows high above nandiwag's head are set at just the proper height for him and all the furnishings are giant size too small doors have been cut for the servants and slanting runways lead up to his table just to the west is a secluded cup-shaped valley in the private residence of the yukahoo witch mrs yoop this enormous castle built of purple stone is high and broad and long but has no turrets or towers only one small window and one big door on each side of the great building tourists may get to see mrs yoop emerge from the castle for every day she walks sixteen times around her secluded castle for exercise but she is and will always remain transformed into a green monkey punishment by Ozma for the former giantess's terrible enchantment of Woot the Wanderer and his friends. Before setting out for the last leg of your trip, you'll be treated to an afternoon cup of coffee, which comes in only one size, giant. On the final day of the tour, August 21st, you will return to the Emerald City, just in time for <clears throat> yet another celebration of Ozma's 15th birthday. You will have all afternoon to explore the palace grounds and gardens, the royal muse, Ozma's splendid throne room, and the magnificent private residences of the celebrities of Oz. Let me take, I don't know, just another 30 minutes or so to describe the delights that we have in store for you in the Emerald City. Wait one minute. This bulletin just in. The Ozmopolitan News Network is reporting that Ozma's royal palace has just been stolen. Uh, Tommy Torres regrets to say that we will not be able to offer this part of the tour package until the situation has been sorted out. Oh, but I have just been authorized to extend to you a very special substitute for your final night, a destination not visited in 108 years. To get there, You'll grab a magic umbrella and head up, 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 through the clouds that resemble turreted castles, past the sky palaces of the Rainbow King and his daughters, to Sky Island and the Blue Palace, a magnificent building having 600 tall towers and turrets, large and lofty rooms with superb furnishings, all in shades of blue. This is the high life. So, on behalf of Tommy Quickstep Tours, I thank you for your attention and encourage you to register now for a tour of the Castles of Oz. Our 15% discount is good until the end of the Two Oz Weekend. <laughs>